Hi guys, this is Ed Briggs, uh, the professor for NUR 520. And what I want to do is a very brief presentation uh, to talk to you about the legislative process and how it impacts on your nursing practice. So what I'm going to do in this presentation is I'm going to very briefly go over the legislative process, how it works. I'm going to talk a little bit about how it's going to impact on your nursing practice and hopefully convince you of the need to be involved in the legislative process so you can more effectively advance legislation that's friendly to advanced practice nurses and then hopefully help you get engaged in the process. Now, um, quick disclaimer, I have no party affiliations. I'm not advancing any specific party agenda. Um, I'm just going to basically give you a Florida legislative update and I may say some things that are my opinion, and I'll, I'll either preface that or explain that it's just my opinion. Now, we're going to talk about advanced practice nurses and improving healthcare delivery for the state and our country. We really need to look at how can we most effectively utilize nurses. Um, we have the largest healthcare workforce, and then as the population ages, we're going to need more healthcare providers. So to move forward and to really meet the healthcare needs of our country, we really need to advance our profession. And that means removing barriers to practice, not only for advanced practice nurses, but also for registered nurses. We need to develop new roles for nurses. Um, I think that we have a phenomenally diverse workforce, and we need to look at what ways nurses can best meet the needs of our communities. An example I love to talk about is um, several states have implemented what they call community paramedics. Basically, it's a paramedic who has the capacity to refill routine prescriptions for people for chronic medications like blood pressure medications, um, insulin, that kind of stuff. And my question is, why can't we develop those roles for registered nurses? Baccalaureate prepared registered nurses are trained and educated in chronic disease management with a great deal of education in pharmacology. So I think that the registered nurse would be a much better fit for that role than a paramedic and can more effectively meet the needs of, of you know, urban dwellers and disenfranchised communities. We need to expand the number of faculty, uh, especially in nursing colleges. Um, the limiting factor in the number of nurses that are practicing is the number of faculty that are available. So we need to come up with legislation that will more effectively grow the number of faculty so we can better meet the needs of, for healthcare delivery and providers. And then we also need to develop legislation and agendas and policies that educate to the future of healthcare. Um, nursing still teaches to predominantly the acute care setting, but the goal of the health home health model is to move people away from the acute care hospital and more towards the home and to community-based services. But for us to take a leadership role in that area, we need to educate to that role. And to do that will require not only health policy change at the colleges, but also legislation to support those changes. And to give you some you know, examples in real terms of, of how policy really impacts on nursing, think about the magical field that sits around hospitals. Um, you know, why is it that someone with no education, no training, has the capacity and the ability to give a child with a fever a Tylenol um, outside the hospital. But the minute they pass that you know, magical barrier, uh, a person who has four years of education in uh, disease management, four years of education in pharmacology, does not have the ability to decide that a child with a fever needs a Tylenol. Um, you know, why do we need a physician's order to tell us how often to take vital signs or how often to turn a patient or so many other things. Um, you know, there's a great deal of limitation on what the registered nurse can do and it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. We also need to shift away from the captain of the ship philosophy where we see the physician as having oversight of all fields of practice. Um, physicians have limited education and training in physical therapy, occupational therapy, I mean, there are so many things that they're in charge of that they know very little about. You know, why does a physician have to sign orders that have been developed by a doctorally prepared physical therapist? 
uh, makes very little sense. So we need to move away from the captain of the ship mentality and use all healthcare providers to their full extent and their full potential to better meet the healthcare needs of our community. We need to prioritize the patient-centered model of care. We need to make the patient the priority and not the provider. And that means developing care centers that are in the communities that we're trying to reach. And that's going to really require funding and legislation. And then we also need to remove the financial tethering of advanced practice nurses and physicians assistants to physicians. Um, that's the big barrier to expanding scope of practice. Um, when we talk about expanding scope of practice for advanced practice nurses and phys physicians assistants, we are talking about um, becoming market competition to physicians. So we need to remove that financial tethering so that, again, we can all practice to the full extent of our education and training um, and not have this competitive uh, environment that seems to exist between medicine and nursing. Again, some of that was my opinion. I apologize. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to review some national health care related legislation and some Florida health care related legislation. But first, let me kind of review the legislative process for those of you who aren't familiar with it. So the legislative process. Step one, sponsorship. Um, and let me preface this by saying uh, the Nurse Practice Act is legislation. So when folks talk about expanding scope of practice for advanced practice nurses or for registered nurses, we're talking about legislation being written and passing to do that. The boards of nursing are not there to, to write or develop the Nurse Practice Act. That is not their role. Their role is to implement the Nurse Practice Act to interpret the law and to ensure public safety, and to ensure that we're all practicing in a safe manner. Um, the boards of nursing do not write the Nurse Practice Act, and they have very little control over the Nurse Practice Act. All the boards of nursing can do is, in, is interpret the law and implement the law. So when folks talk about, well, the board of nursing should change that, they really can't. Any changes to the Nurse Practice Act have to come through the form of legislation, and that means a bill. So the first step in a bill is sponsorship. Basically, you need a, a representative in the House and a senator in the Senate to sponsor a bill addressing an issue. Now, typically, legislators don't actually write the bills. Uh, someone will bring them the bill and ask them to sponsor the bill. Um, as president of the Florida Nurses Association, we did that on many occasions. We would write a bill and then bring it to a legislator and ask them to sponsor it. Um, in Florida, legislators are limited in the number of bills they can sponsor, so they're typically very selective about what bills they're going to take on. They want a bill that really is something that they're interested in, that they really believe in, and they really think is going to pass. Um, they don't want to sponsor bills that they know are going to fail simply because it just doesn't look good. And a large bit of politics is how things look. So first step is you need to find a sponsor in the House and the Senate who will sponsor a bill. Um, if you cannot get both houses, the House and the Senate, then it's a dead bill. You really need a House in both the House and the Senate. Once a bill is sponsored, it will be sent to the Speaker of the House and the President of the Senate, who will then review the bill and determine how many committees need to hear the bill, um, basically to ensure that it's a safe and appropriate bill. So the Senate will decide how many committees will hear it, the House will decide how many committees will hear it, and typically committee assignment depends on the bill. So for example, if it's a House, if it's a health care related bill that's going to have some economic impact to the state, it will be assigned to some health care committees, it will be assigned to some appropriations committees and some finance committees. Um, so that's the process. Now, one of the things in Florida and many states that have limited legislative sessions, um, a good way to kill a bill or to stop a bill is to assign it to a bunch of committees. So here in Florida, we have a 60-day legislative session. All bills have to get through the session in 60 days. Any bill that doesn't pass in 60 days is a dead bill. So a great way to kill a bill is to assign it to a bunch of committees. It won't make it through all those committees in time, so it's a dead bill. So that's one of the factors you really need to consider. You know, so once a bill is assigned to committees, the committee chair has the option to schedule those committee hearings. So another way that a bill can be killed is if the Senate president or the, I'm sorry, the committee chair 
doesn't table the bill for discussion. So all I have to do is just ignore the bill and it's a dead bill. So a committee will hear a bill, they will discuss a bill, and they will vote up or down. Um, they also have the option to amend the bill, to make changes in the bill. If a bill passes, it will then go on to the next committee. If it fails, it's a dead bill. So if a committee votes down a bill, then it's a dead bill. So once a bill passes all of its assigned committees, it will then proceed to the floor of the House or the floor of the Senate. On the floor of the House or the floor of the Senate, there will then be debate and there will be a final vote. So the House and the Senate will either, they'll, they'll hear the bill, they'll debate the bill, they'll make any amendments they feel are appropriate, and they will either pass or, you know, not pass a bill. Once a bill passes, it will then go to a conference committee. And the purpose of a conference committee is to work out differences. Um, the bill that passes the House and the bill that passes the Senate may not be the exact same. So the conference committee will then work out um, changes to bills to make sure that they're the exact same bill and they are now one bill. That bill will then be forwarded to either the president if it's a piece of federal legislation or to the governor if it's a piece of state legislation. And then the governor and the president have the option of vetoing a bill or signing a bill. Uh, in both the national and in the state, any bill that is vetoed can be overridden, so the House and the Senate can override a veto with three two-thirds majority vote. So even if the governor or the president veto a bill, the House and the Senate can override that veto, but it requires two-thirds majority to do that. Um, in Florida, there is a, a stipulation that a bill can go forward if the governor just doesn't sign it but doesn't veto it. So. There have been several occasions where the governor basically has not signed the bill, but he hasn't vetoed the bill. So that becomes law, but without a governor's signature. So that's essentially the legislative process from beginning to end. Um, now remember, there are a lot of key factors to be considered. Um, so when a nursing bill is moving forward, uh, all interests that feel the bill should move forward are going to lobby or educate legislators, trying them to trying to get them to uh, vote yes on the bill. Those who oppose it will try to convince the legislators to vote no. Um, there are a lot of factors going on, a lot of lobbyists trying to gain influence and convince people. And then legislators are going to look at those kind of factors. You know, who's supporting the bill, who's opposing the bill, um, who's supporting me, and where they stand on that bill. Where do uh, my constituents, the folks that are in my legislative district, stand on the bill? So a lot of factors playing into what happens to a bill. Now I want to review some national legislation and what's going on with some national legislation. And again, the same rules apply. You need a bill in the House and the Senate. Uh, they have to pass. They have to go through the committees. And then the president has to sign or veto the bill. So, H.R. 1247, which is Improving Veterans Access to Care Bill, um, please note that there's no Senate bill. So, essentially, this is a dead bill. It's not going to go any further unless there is a Senate component. Um, it is sponsored by Representative Graves and Representative Schakowsky. Um, basically, what it would do, it would lift restrictions on nurse practitioners within the VA system so we can increase access to care. Um, the American Medical Association strongly opposes this bill. And at this point, it's not moved forward very much. Senate Bill 578 and House Bill 1342, Home Health Care Planning Improvement Act. Um, essentially, this bill would, it's a more of a grammatical correction. Um, under federal law, a advanced practice nurse or a physician's assistant can order a home health care, home health care evaluation. The home health care company can go in, can evaluate, can uh, write a plan of care and then forward it back to the person who ordered the referral, but it requires a physician's signature to sign that plan of care. Um, this bill would basically lift that restriction and would allow PAs, NPs, and um, physician's assistants and nurse practitioners to sign, sign home health care orders. Um, this is going through committees. There's some opposition to it and we're kind of waiting to see what happens. HR 12-27-13, this is the um, 
renewal of the Workforce Reauthorization Act. Um, basically, this is federal funding for nursing school scholarships, for uh, nursing faculty scholarships, um, and for different programs that affect nursing. Um, this bill actually passed and made it both through the House and the Senate, and it has been reauthorized. So um, there's a lot of funding there for nurse faculty positions, lots of student loans, lots of grants. So uh, the American Nurses Association strongly supported this bill, and it did make it through, and it has been signed into law. And then finally, the Registered Nurse Safe Staffing Act. This is H.R. 2083 and Senate Bill 1132. Essentially, this is sponsored and supported by the American Nurses Association, and it would require um, all hospitals that participate in Medicare and Medicaid to establish a safe staffing committee. That committee would have to be made up predominantly of registered nurses who work on the units and cannot be part of management. This committee would then establish safe staffing plans for each unit taking into multiple factors like uh, the layout of the, the physical unit, the acuity composition of the patients, the skill mix of the nurses, and then establish a safe staffing plan for each unit. Um, this bill has not moved very much. Um, it's been kind of stalled. And again, it's not a fixed ratio bill, so it's not a five to one, three to one. It would require a collaborative council to develop safe staffing plans. So these are some of the national pieces of legislation that are out there and really are, are either moving forward or they're not moving forward. And again, there are a lot of different factors that play into it. If you want to look up uh, national pieces of legislation, you can go to govtrack.us, govtrack.us, and it then lists all the federal pieces of legislation that are being considered. You can type in a search term, for example, nursing, and it will pull up all bills that include the phrase nursing. So if you're looking for a bill to discuss in your discussion board, this is a good site to go to for national pieces of legislation. Now I want to talk about a little bit about Florida legislation. I'm going to go through this very quickly. Now the Florida legislative session for 2016 has started. It begins, uh, it actually is this Monday. It begins this Monday. Uh, I'm sorry, Tuesday, January 12th. It is a 60-day session and will run um, through, uh, I think it's the beginning of March. So it's a 60 day session begins January 12th. Um, committees have been going on since September and many of the nursing related bills have been heard in committee. So one bill is H Bill 77, uh, safe lifting bill. Um, again, notice that it is a House bill only. There is no Senate companion. Um, it has been assigned to the Health Innovation Subcommittee um, mm -hmm. and was heard on September 10th. It uh, did pass, but again, there's no Senate bill, so essentially it is a dead bill. And this would require a uh, hospital committee comprised of nurses and hospital management to set up uh, safe lifting policies. But the bill is really not moving forward. It is strongly opposed by the Florida Hospital Association. Senate Bill 0152 and House Bill 1241, Ordering of Medications. It's sponsored by Denise Grimsley and Representative Placencia. Basically, this would allow nurse practitioners and physicians' assistants to order controlled substances under the direct supervision of a physician in hospitals and healthcare facilities, including nursing homes. Um, it has been referred to several committees. It has passed through all of them, with the exception of appropriations. It's aim appropriations and expected to pass. So um, it has not had any House committees hear it yet, um, but it probably will. So essentially this would, like in my example, I'm an emergency room nurse practitioner. If I see a patient with a broken arm, I want to give them uh, Vicodin for pain. I need to find a physician, get the physician to go to the computer, type in the order, and then I can go back to the patient. Uh, not a very practical system. So this would allow nurse practitioners and PAs to order medications that are controlled within healthcare facilities. And this is supported by the Florida Nurse Practitioner Network as well as the Florida Nursing Association. House Bill 37 and Senate Bill 132 direct primary care. This allows individuals to go into direct contract with healthcare providers, including advanced practice nurses, for healthcare. So essentially this would be kind of a concierge uh, healthcare delivery 
where you can contract with a nurse practitioner or physician to provide primary care services. Um, and that could include things like, you know, you, the patient would have your cell phone number, they can call you whenever they need to. Um, this was filed in 2015 but didn't pass. Um, and really the impact of this bill, is no one's quite sure. But it would allow physicians and nurse practitioners to go into contract services with patients. Uh, HB 85 and Senate Bill 212, Recovery Care Centers. Essentially what this would do is would allow ambulatory care sur surgery centers to keep patients for up to 72 hours um, post-care. So let's say you're having a minor surgery. You can stay at the minor, minor surgery center for up to 72 hours and have to have to be admitted to a hospital. Now again, this does not include intensive care services, coronary care services, or critical care services. So um, this bill has been sponsored by Representative Fitzhangen and uh, Don Gates and has the support of the Florida Hospital Association and the Florida Medical Association. Senate Bill 210, and there are, there are multiple bills um, regarding nurse practitioners out in the works. This is one of the big ones. Um, the big factors would be that it would allow nurse practitioners and physician's assistants to prescribe uh, controlled substances. Um, it would require that a committee be formed made up of physicians, nurse practitioners, and pharmacists. That committee would establish a formulary of controlled substances that nurse practitioners could prescribe and then they would be limited to a prescription of seven days. So we'd be able to prescribe medications that this committee decides are in the formulary and we would only be allowed to prescribe uh, seven days worth of it. Um, and it would only allow, require only psychiatric nurse practitioners to prescribe uh, mental health, con controlled mental health prescriptions to children. So uh, this bill has been referred to multiple committees and has actually advanced. It is being supported by the Amer Florida Nurses Association and the Florida Nurse Practitioner Network, um, along with other associations. Those associations are right now working with the sponsors to try to make some amendments. We have some concerns about the formulary, and we also have some concerns about the seven-day limit. Hopefully we'll be able to get some uh, reconciliation and some compromise from the sponsors, but ultimately we are supporting the bill at this point. And have some more information regarding the bill. Uh, HB 187, Staffing Ratios in Healthcare Facilities. Again, it is a House bill only. Uh, it has no um, Senate companion, so essentially it's a dead bill. And this is a fixed ratio bill that required fixed ratios. Um, to give you guys some insight, uh, several years ago, the Florida Nurses Association had put forward a uh, collaborative council bill. And basically the bill would have required that hospitals establish a committee uh, and similar to the American Nurses Association bill. Um, that committee would be made up predominantly of nurses who work on the unit. That committee would establish safe staffing plans based on the physical plant of the facility the education makeup of the patients, I'm sorry, the providers, the acuity level of the patients, and availability of lift devices. Um, it would also require that the staffing plan would be made public so that the community could, you know, actually compare who has better staffing. The bill actually had been advanced and actually moved forward, but then was pulled at the last minute. Right now, the Florida Nurses Association has a safe staffing committee, which I chair, that is working on developing another bill that we will probably f put forward in the near future. So um, there are some possibilities out there. House Bill 89 and Senate Bill 248, the kid care program. Um, basically for um, immigrants to the country who are here legally, uh, the kid care program is an insurance assistance program to help um, low-income families buy health insurance for children. Under the bill, um, immigrants who are here legally and have a green card cannot enroll in the program for five years once they come to the country. Uh, this bill would remove that five-year restriction and allow legal immigrants who are here legally um, to 
access these dollars and to help them buy health insurance for the children. Um, it's being sponsored by Representative uh, Jose Diaz and Representative Senator Garcia, and it's expected this bill will pass. Orderings of medications by Denise Grimsley. Um, we went over that a little bit before, so I apologize, that's a repeat. Uh, House Bill 325 and Senate Bill 572, involuntary bake racks. This would allow physicians assistants and ARNPs to initiate involuntary examinations under the Baker Act here in Florida. Um, last year's bill gave psychiatric nurse practitioners the ability to initiate and to rescind uh, Baker Acts. This bill would expand on that and allow ARNPs to initiate a Baker Act. House Bill 123 and Senate Bill 142, the federal student loan default rates. Um, essentially, what has happened is uh, about six or seven years ago, Florida legislators uh, passed a piece of legislation that removed the ability of the Board of Nursing to inspect nursing education programs. Um, so the Board of Nursing cannot go into in nursing programs and inspect them um, to make sure that they're actually complying with the education standards. Um, the only ability the Board had for count for counseling education programs was to look at the pass rates on the NCLEX. Um, now, last year we had a revision to that requiring that all the schools become certified by a national certifying uh, body like uh, AACN within five years. But we've seen a proliferation of nursing schools that really are not meeting acceptable standards and really are subpar. And we're seeing a great number of students passing from these programs who do not have the ability to pass NCLEX. They basically do not have the education that they need to really pass. So we're seeing a lot of uh, these students taking up federal student loans, making it through the programs, and then being unable to pass the boards, and therefore they're unable to pay, pay repay their student loans. Many of these students also have uh, access to state dollars. So this bill would basically um, remove Florida state funding to these private education programs um, if they have high default rates on their federal student loans. Um, it's expected, and the American Florida Nurses Association supports this bill. So that's basically an overview of some of the bills that are coming forward. There are lots of other bills, and you can go to the Florida House website or the Florida Senate website to look at what bills are coming forward. So some key things to remember is that if there's a bill that you're supporting, you feel that you want to advance, it will be heard in the committees and has to pass through the committee. So it's important that we contact committee members regarding bills that we support, engage them, and try to get them to vote in favor of the bills or to even put forward amendments to the bill that we support. Once the bill gets through all the committees, it needs to go to the floor and pass on the floor. So it then becomes important that our representatives or our senators vote in favor of the bills on the floor. And then we need to get the governor to sign it. So that requires that we be engaged with all aspects, the committees, the senators and representatives, and the governor to advance our agenda. And, you know, if we don't support our bills, if we don't, share with our legislators our feelings about the bill, then they're typically hearing from lobbyists. And I can assure you uh, the medical community, the hospital associations, the different insurance companies have many more lead lobbyists than the nurses do. So that if we don't make sure our voice is heard, then typically legislators will hear more from the lobbyists for entities that may not be representing the best interests of nursing. So moving forward, it's important that you advocate for your profession, and that's part of the purpose of this class, to get you to understand the processes that are involved in health policy legislation, and then give you the skills you need to advocate for your profession, and then also teach you how to engage with the legislators. So, you know, with the elevator speech, that's an exercise in how to engage legislators, how to educate them in our issues. We talk about uh, lobbying, 
Lobbying is nothing more than educating legislators on a key issue. So our goal is to teach you how to advocate and to teach you how to engage legislators and policy leaders. And I hope that, that this lecture gives you some insight into some Florida legislation that's going on and maybe gives you some direction about the discussion, but gives you some clues about where you can find some information as well. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Um, I tried to make this as brief as possible, but to help you as much as I can. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.